Check out this bebop line from Oscar Peterson. This is the opening phrase from Nice Work If You Can Get It from the album Oscar Peterson Plays the George Gershon Songbook. When I was earlier in my journey, I remember being awestruck by just how Oscar could take essentially a blank page of chord changes and turn it into a crazy line like this and to do so basically effortlessly. But over the years, I've learned more about how these lines work and I've taught my students to come up with these same kinds of lines themselves. And there's really only five ideas that we need to learn. So let's pull out the metronome and get started. This video is sponsored by Jazz Fundamentals, which is an online course that teaches you all the fundamental building blocks of playing jazz. You can take my seven day soloing challenge over there totally for free forever. Just click the link down in the description to get started. Let's start by taking a look at the transcription. This past Sunday night, we had a live stream where we transcribed the phrase off of the record itself. If you missed it, there's a replay up on the channel. Let's play through this a little bit slower. Something I hear all the time from my students and other videos here on YouTube is that we need to memorize a whole bunch of licks and then we assemble our solos by piecing those licks together back to back. And look, there's nothing wrong with practicing licks. It's actually good for you and we're gonna use them a lot, but it's really important that we know how to construct our solo lines ourselves so that we're free to express ourselves artistically and to truly improvise. So I'm not even gonna talk about licks at all today, but without them, how are we gonna determine what notes to play? This entire introduction is kind of like a game of musical connect the dots. Oscar has different phrase ideas, different target notes in mind that he wants to aim for, and then we're gonna connect the dots between all those notes with different types of movements. The first thing that I notice when I look at a transcription like this is just how dense it is. It's kind of a flurry of notes that goes by really fast. It's a huge string of eighth notes through almost the entire introduction, and that can be really intimidating to look at. But in the reality, there's a much simpler line in here that we can hear, and I would call this a guide tone line. So if we take a look at just this first phrase, let's just look at the, the overarching structure of it. We go from E flat up an octave to another E flat, and then we come down to A flat. So there's this big line that goes up an octave, E flat to E flat, and then it comes back down a little bit. And notably here, it starts on E flat, which is the seventh of F minor, and it ends here on A flat, which is the third of the F minor chord that we're going to. It gets there by way of going up here to the ninth of D flat seven. So those are kind of the key dots in this phrase that we have to connect. This next one kind of starts here on D flat. Don't worry about these few notes beforehand. We're gonna come back to those in a second. And it goes on a journey from D flat again, down an octave to D flat. Now here, uh, the D flat is the third of B flat minor. This should be B flat minor. It's the third of this B flat minor chord. And then when we get down here to the D flat at the end, this D flat is the seventh of E flat minor. So I want you to notice a pattern from just the first two phrases already. The first note of our phrase belongs to the first chord, but the last note of the phrase belongs to the chord that's coming next. This is an important thing for us to remember as we're soloing is that we don't want to play a chord and then kind of react to it by soloing on that chord afterwards. We want to guide the listener's ear into the next chord. So we're actually going to start thinking about the next chord a little bit ahead of time. Let's keep an eye on that as we keep going. So our next phrase goes here from E flat. That is the one of E flat minor. And it takes us, <laughs> there's an ice cream truck outside. Can you hear it? Go away. What are you doing here? We're trying to play jazz. He's, he's in C major. Doesn't he know there are YouTubers hard at work up here? Okay, I guess we just gotta deal with it. Let's look at the next phrase. So this next phrase goes from E flat minor. It starts on E flat, that's the one. And it takes us over here to the F, which is the five of B flat seven. So it looks like he does it again here on this last phrase. We go here from D flat. Again, don't worry about the notes that come before it. We'll talk about those in a second. D flat, which is the third of B flat minor. And he brings us all the way over here to G, which is the third of E flat. This is E flat seven is our final chord in the uh, progression. Okay, so we can see the general phrases and the target notes that Oscar is aiming for with each of these phrases. And we can see how he's using those to transition us from one chord to the next. 
But now we gotta play connect the dots. And how are we gonna decide what notes go between those chords? And there are four different ways I want to show you. Let's put the transcription aside for a second and let's just look at this over two chords. Let's pick some easy ones. Let's do C6 and F6. So one to four. All right, let's pick a note from the F chord that we're gonna aim for. Let's say this A, it's the third of F. And there are four different ways that we could lead ourselves toward that A. Let's talk about the first one, which is scale motion, which just means we're gonna take whatever key we're in, the key of C, and we're gonna use the notes from the scale to get us there. Or we could come down. Or we could take a longer one. The second idea that we could do would be to use approach notes. And this is the same basic idea as the scale, except we're gonna use the chromatic scale. So if we're aiming for this A, we could come at it from a half step below. We could use two half steps, three half steps, or you could come from the top. The chromatic scale has a great way to give you direction and momentum and gravity towards that note that you're resolving. The third thing that we could do would be to use an arpeggio, which would give us something like this. Or coming down from the top. When we're playing arpeggio motion, you might think that we have to play notes from the chord, and that is actually not true. What I'm talking about on arpeggio is just a movement where we're moving by skips, by thirds, right? So this is an arpeggio. It's an arpeggio of C6. Those are using all notes of our C6 chord, but we don't have to. We could do that instead. This is still an arpeggio, and it doesn't really matter to me that it doesn't belong to the notes of C6. These go by really fast, and all it's meant to do is to create some direction toward this note that is our target note. So our fourth idea is called an enclosure, and an enclosure is kind of a way of reaching our target note from both directions at the same time. We're gonna take one note from above and one note from below, and then we're finally gonna land on the target in the middle. And it sounds like this. The basic way to create an enclosure is to use a scale note above our target tone. So in this case, it would be a B, and then a half step below our target note, which would be G sharp, and then our A. Our top note comes from the scale. Our bottom note is always a half step below, even if it's not in the key. You don't have to do this with just two notes either. You could do it with three, or you could do it the opposite direction where we go from the bottom to the top, or do it that way with three notes. There are so many creative ways to do this. So we're gonna go back to look at the Oscar Peterson transcription here in a second and see if we can identify these in action. But I really wanna emphasize that you should practice the heck out of these. This is like not gonna waste your time at all. You're gonna use these things all the time when you're learning to create solo lines. They really should be second nature to you. I would really encourage you to practice all four of these different ideas by finding different target tones from each chord. So if we're here in F6 again, practice going to the, practice our scale motion going up to the F and down and practice doing it to the third. Practice doing it to the fifth. and practice doing it to the sixth. And I'm doing it there with four scale notes, but you could do it with three, you could do it with five, you could do it with eight, you know, <laughs> that's just a major scale, but you could do whatever you want. Then I would practice doing these with approach notes. So again, uh, this is a half step below. Or maybe we do two approaches. Do it going down also. Then practice all the arpeggios. And then practice all the enclosures. And then once you've done that, you're gonna to try to combine these ideas, right? So maybe you'll do an arpeggio up and then end in an enclosure. Or we could do the opposite. We could do an enclosure that goes into an arpeggio. 
And you start to play with this stuff and it really starts to sound like bebop. So let's take a look at this transcription and see if we can see these things in action. Let's look here at this D flat seven. We're aiming for this E flat, right? The E flat is the note that we're targeting. And we're getting there with these notes here. And if you look at them, it's all chromatic. This is our approach, concept number two. That's aiming us toward that E flat. Our next target note would be this D flat. And we get there with two notes ahead of it. E flat, C, D flat. That's our enclosure. And then if we look at the next one, we're going to C, and we get there with these two notes. That's another enclosure. In fact, it's chained off of the first one. You see that move all the time. Let's keep going. So our F here, our D, we don't have an approach. We just start the phrase there, and then we're aiming for the D flat, and look what we get. E flat, C, D flat. That's our enclosure again. And here we go. We're going from F and we're gonna go to this B flat here. So the B flat, the two notes before B flat here are, it's a kind of enclosure we didn't talk about. It's a chromatic enclosure where it's chromatic above, chromatic below. And look what comes before it over here is an arpeggio. So that's our combining the arpeggio up with the enclosure on the end. And then here we've got an arpeggio down. So moving on here to this E flat minor chord, we're targeting the C, which is the six, and we come at it from a half step below. That's our approach. And then we're going up to this B flat and we're doing that with an arpeggio. And then the same thing kind of repeats just in a different key. We have a G, which is a half step below A flat, our target. And then that's an arpeggio up to the B flat, to the B flat, to the G flat. And then look here, we're aiming for the F and we get two approach notes, two half steps below. So this whole line, it's approach note to arpeggio, approach note to arpeggio, to approach notes. That is such a hip bebop line. But when you break it down, it's really pretty simple. So up next, we're aiming for this D flat, which is the third of B flat minor. And we're getting there here with these three notes. I'm gonna call that an enclosure because it surrounds it, but it could be two approach notes. And then let's go all the way to the end here. This is a big fun phrase. So we're ending here on the third of E flat. We're getting there here with this, which is an enclosure. And before the enclosure, here is a chromatic. So that's an approach. And then here is an arpeggio. How freaking cool is this? So I'm gonna play through this again and see if you can hear these uh, scales, approaches, enclosures, and arpeggios. Two, three, four. So far, we've just talked about what notes that we can play and how we come about connecting the dots between our different target notes, but we've neglected the most important part of all of this, which is the rhythm. Of course, rhythm is a topic entirely of its own. I have several videos here on the channel that talk about it, but I want you to notice a couple things that are important, and it has to do with the variety of the notes that fall on the beat and off the beat. Jazz is all about swing and syncopation. In order to get that kind of like off kilter dance feel, syncopation has to have a variety of things that fall on the beat and off the beat. And the way that we do that when we're creating solo lines is we pay really close attention to where our lines start and where our lines end. Oftentimes we're gonna connect the starting and ending points with straight eighth notes or maybe eighth note triplets, but where those things start and end in the measure is going to determine our swing feel. So if we look at this, just pay attention to where Oscar starts and ends his lines. He starts on beat one, and then he ends on the end of three. The next one starts on beat one, but this one ends on beat four. So, so far we've been on the beat, off the beat, on the beat, on the beat. Now we're on the beat again. We end off the beat. We start off the beat. 
we end off the beat, we play again off the beat. This is a really common mistake that I see my students make all the time. They get very comfortable in rhythm patterns and they repeat those same patterns over and over again. Well, they'll play an entire, you know, 16, 32 bars where every phrase starts on beat one and ends on beat three. It doesn't matter how interesting of notes that you pick at that point because the rhythm itself is gonna be monotonous and boring. So it's really worth your time to practice creating lines that start and end in different places. The other thing I wanna point out, if you look at this transcription or any other Oscar Peterson transcription, and I've looked at a lot of them, almost all of his phrases end off the beat. Almost every one, I would say 90% of them end off the beat and 10% end on the beat. If you invest the time to practice this rhythmic variety, starting lines in different places and ending off the beat in different places, you're gonna sound so rhythmically mature and so interesting that the notes you pick will come much easier. You cannot disguise bad rhythm with cool notes, but you can get away with boring notes if you play them with interesting rhythm. The rhythm is everything. You might be wondering what scales you can use when you're soloing over stuff like this. You might know a bebop scale like this, but my great teacher Barry Harris told me that bebop scales were bullshit. And so here's what he said we should use instead.